So last week we stopped off at the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So last week or the week before we started Al-Akhbar, meaning the Sunnah last week, naam, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we said that evidences of the Usuliyun are split into two. There are those evidence in which there's a consensus over and that be in the Qur'an of Allah Jalla wa Ala as evidence, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, Al-Ijma' and Al-Qiyas These four, there's consensus among the scholars in all of the madahib that they are accepted as proof for rulings pertaining to the Sharia of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala so we're now, and then the second part or the second category is evidences which there is a difference of opinion over. So yes, or last week we started on a sunnah. And the sunnah of the Prophet, or the sunnah according to the Usuliyun is what? According to the scholars of Usul al Fiqh. What is sunnah? Ma'udif al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi that which has been attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Min qawlin, or fi'lin, or taqirin. La, wasf is not included according to the Usuliyun. Why? Because when the Usuliyun are looking at, uh, when they're looking at uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they only want those things that you can derive rulings from. They want those things that rulings can be derived from. So we did not talk about, and the Sheikh himself does not bring a specific section dealing with the statements of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because everything that has preceded is connected to the statements of the Prophet, because the command. Is from the statements of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How do we understand that command? A a nahi, a, a a prohibition, a general statement, am, a specific statement, a khas, a mutlaq statement, a muqayyad. All of these are pertaining to the statements of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like in the Shaykh rahimahullah, he talked about the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he split the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam into five, and we added another two. Right. So today, inshallah, we're going to start with al iqrar which is the third type of sunnah with regards to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and iqrar means in, in, in simple terms it means those things that were done in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or he had knowledge of their occurrence and he did not refrain, tell them to refrain from it he did not refute it and he did not condemn it sallallahu alaihi wasallam the shaykh says rahimahullah wa amma taqriruhu sallallahu alaihi wasallam ala shay'in fa huwa dalilun ala jawazihi على الوجه الذي أقره قولا كان أم فعلا مثال إقراره على القول. so طيب first and foremost with regards to the أصوليون التقريب means كف الكف عن الإنكار الكف عن الإنكار which means to abstain from condemning to stay away or to refrain from condemning. Al-Iqrar or Al-Sunnah Al-Taqririya means Al-Kaffu An Al-Inkar which means to abstain from condemning something or prohibiting something. So that is the meaning of Al-Sunnah Al-Taqririya where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam acknowledges something. طيب. And the Sunnah Taqririya, in most cases, it refers to or it shows permissibility. It shows permissibility. And it is lesser in strength than the statements of the Prophet ﷺ and the actions of the Prophet ﷺ. So if we were to look at the Prophet ﷺ, his Sunnah, if we were to look at the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, in terms of strength, the strongest are, or the strongest category is the statements of the Prophet ﷺ. Because in most cases, the Sunnah, the, the, the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ says, there's less possibilities. 
The second in line is the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And thirdly, and thirdly, it is the taqirat of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the taqirat of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam means those things that were done in his presence, as we shall see, like in he did not condemn. And in often, in most cases, they point towards permissibility. Why is that? Because if it wasn't permissible, if it isn't permissible, then it is a what? A sin. And the Prophet ﷺ would not condone a sin. Why is this a type of hujjah or a proof to show permissibility? Because if there was any sin connected to it, the Prophet ﷺ would have told his companions to stay away from it because it is a sin. And the Prophet ﷺ would not acknowledge them and allow them to commit a sin. Then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, ala al wajh al So taqreer, we accept it as evidence, and it is permissible in the way that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded it for it, commanded for it to be done, or the way it was done, the specific scenario that he allowed to take place. That is how we, that is how we understand it. So an example that the Mashaykh mentioned or the scholars mentioned is Ahlul Quba. When they changed, when the Qibla was changed, Ahlul Quba was still praying, praying towards Bayt al Maqdis. Ahlul Quba was still praying towards Bayt al Maqdis. Although the verse has been revealed or the ruling has been uh, abrogated and changed to Makkah. So a person came to the people of Makkah, uh, Quba, telling them, informing them that the Qibla had been changed. So during the time of the Prophet, sallallahu during the time of the Salah, they turned around and faced Mecca. They turned around and faced the Haram of Mecca. So that action obviously took place during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he would have known about it Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he didn't know it was taking place at the time, he would have been informed that it took place later on. So the, 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 the evident point of evidence is, or the Mahalu Shahid, he did not rebuke that action. He did not say to them, Ya Jama'ah, next time complete your salah facing whichever qibla you face at the beginning of the salah. So what do we take from that understanding? We take from the understanding that if we find someone praying near us or next to us, and we walk, if we walk into a room and someone's praying towards other than the qibla, we're allowed to move them so that they face the qibla. Or if they find out where the qibla is, مثلاً, for example, someone is praying here and they're facing that qibla. They've got sutra there where the first table is and they're facing that qibla. Then someone else prays right in front of them or towards their right hand side and they face that way. That person can now what? Turn whilst he is in salah. Based on this sunnah at taqariya that the Prophet ﷺ did not condemn. Another example of a sunnah taqariya is the hadith of Bilal radiallahu anhu where he would pray two rak'at every time he performed wudu. He would pray two rak'at every th- time he performed wudu. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him that he heard the sound of his walking or his uh, sandals in Jannah. And he asked him what he had done and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi or what he had done to get that virtue. And, the Prophet, and Bilal radiallahu anhu told him that he prays two rak'at every time he makes wudu. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam acknowledged that. The Prophet ﷺ acknowledged that. Also, the Prophet ﷺ saw the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, as Anas says, that when the adhan would be called for Salat al Maghrib, that they would pray, everyone would go to a corner of the masjid or a part of the masjid and they would pray Sunnah until Salat al Maghrib. They would pray two rak'at between the adhan of Maghrib and the Salat of Maghrib. And Anas said, عنه, the Prophet did not command us and he did not what? Prohibit us from praying. Did not command us or prohibit us from praying. Also, as for those things that are mubah, so these two examples that I've just mentioned are sunnah. The example of a mubah, something that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam acknowledged, acknowledged that was mubah, is when a type of food, a lizard, I believe it was, was placed on the table that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting at, and when it was presented to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he did not wish to eat it. And Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, uh, they both ate 
obviously asking the, the answer of Prophet وسلم, if it was permissible to eat and he said naam it's permissible to eat like and I just don't want it because it's not from the food of my people so it was permissible for them to eat so we find from that that the Prophet acknowledged their action and allowed for it to go ahead where do we understand this? If it was haram, would the Prophet have allowed them to eat the haram? No, of course not. So that is where Sunnah Taqirir comes into it. Right. The scholars split, split Sunnah Taqirir into different categories, from different angles. From those i'tibarat, they say, where the Prophet wasallam acknowledged a person on a statement that they said. Or the Prophet wasallam acknowledged a person on action that they did. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ acknowledged in a statement that a person said, the Hadith al Jariyah, where the Prophet ﷺ came across one of the companions, Muawiyah ibn Hakim, I believe it was, who had slept his slave girl. And then when the Prophet ﷺ asked her, Ain Allah, she said, Fi Sa'ma. And who am I? Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ said, fa innaha mu'mina. Release her, free her, for verily she is a believer. The Mahalu Shahid is where? The Prophet sallallahu acknowledged her statement. What was her statement? Allah fi sama. So we find a few benefits in there. First and foremost, if Allah jalla wa ala wasn't in the sama, he would have said to her, ittaqillah. He would have said to her, la, Allah jalla wa ala is not fi sama. And he would have said, Allah, yani whatever else would be. Therefore, we understand from there that Allah jalla wa ala, this is one of the evidences that Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah use to prove the ulu of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the highness of Allah jalla wa ala. طيب. Also we understand from there that it's permissible to also use It is permissible to use Or to, to ask this question Ain Allah Why? بِالدَّلِيلِ مَادَ What is the evidence that is permissible to ask? قَوْلُ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى وَسَلَمُ The Prophet himself صلى الله عليه وسلم asks So if the Prophet asks Then who are we to To, uh, to deny the question And to deny the answer And to deny Deny the answer. Another example of the Prophet of an action being done during the time of the Prophet ﷺ is the companion who would read Surah Al-Ikhlas every time he had completed another Surah. So whenever he would pray, he would read Surah Al-Ikhlas. So the companions came, some of the companions came back to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him, asked the Prophet about this action. The Prophet ﷺ said, ask him why he does it. And when he, radiallahu anhu, answered with and said that it is from it has the attributes of a Rahman and I love to read it. And then the Prophet sallallahu said to him or told them to inform him that Allah jalla wa'ala also loves him. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him. So the Prophet sallallahu acknowledged this and he did not refute him for doing so. And he did not say to him, La, do not read Surah Al-Ikhlas every day. طيب, we take from there the permissibility of reading two surahs after the Fatiha in any one raka'ah. طيب, we also take from there that it is permissible like we can't go as far as saying it is a sunnah. Rather, it is a sunnah taqririya. And in most cases, those things that the Prophet gave taqririya of, acknowledgement of, they fall under the qism or the section of al-jawaz. In the section of jawaz. Also, another example where the Prophet ﷺ allowed uh, for an action to be done is when the, there were a group of Ethiopians playing in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And I believe it was Eid day. They were... Uh, celebrating with the Muslims and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allowed for it to take place, which is an evidence that it is permissible sometimes to uh, to do these sorts of things in the masjid. طيب. The scholars also split Sunnah taqiyya into two different categories from a different angle in terms of bi'tibari ilm al-Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam bi'tibari. Ilmi Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam When you're looking at the knowledge of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So the first category, and there are two categories The first category is Ma'alima bihi Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam That which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew of So these two points that I'm about to, I'm about to mention is The first Something that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew of, whether it was done in his presence or whether it was done elsewhere, and they came and asked him. So, for example, the hadiths that have just passed, the iqrar of the jariyah, the slave girl, when he sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked, "Ain Allah," that taqrir, did the Prophet have knowledge of it? Huh? 
the taqiyyid of Ain Allah, when he said to Ain Allah. He knew not, had knowledge of it. How do we know? Because he was the one that was asking Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The hadith of the hadith of turning in the qibla as they were in Masjid Quba, the Prophet wasn't there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he was there, they would have faced the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the qibla. Lakin he wasn't there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they found out later on. So that wasn't done in his presence, like he would have known about it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, the tayammum of Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu and Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they required ghusl, each one, and there was a situation where they didn't have water. Ammar radiallahu anhu done tayammum, and Umar radiallahu anhu did not do tayammum. And then they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that was an action that was done elsewhere, and then they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they told him. So, Ammar bin Yasir radiallahu anhu, he told him uh, that, كَانَ يَكْفِيكَ كَهَكَدَا And he showed him how to perform wudu. Where have we come across that hadith? Or that incident? Huh? Which da'ah? The khilaf. Naam, al-khilaf bayna al-ulama. Al-khilaf bayna al-ulama. طيب ده كتاب الشيخ من الثيمي رحمه الله تعالى رحمة الله تعالى طيب so that is another example that is another example so that first category is what that which the prophet had knowledge of whether it was done in his presence whether he was there at the time or whether he found out later on the second category is ما وقع في عهده ولم يرد أنه أخبر به ولم يرد أنه أخبر به Number the second category is ما وقع في عهده something that happened during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and there was nothing proving that he had he had been informed. It was done during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and there's no specific evidence showing that it was that he sallallahu alaihi wasallam would be or was informed. And for this second category, the scholars split, split it into two types as well. This second category, which is what? مَا وَقَعَ فِي عَهْدِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَلَمْ يَرِدْ أَنَّهُ أُخْبِرَ بِهِ That which was done in the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, like there's no evidence stating that he was informed or that he was even there at that place or location where it was done. This is the category the scholars divide into two. They categorize it into two. The first category is that something like this action, it is impossible for it to be hidden from the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning the Prophet would have known about it. It's something that the Prophet ﷺ would have known about. And it's almost impossible to say that he had no knowledge of it. I'm going to give you two examples and then you can tell me which one is closer or rather, let me explain to you both. The first is the hadith that states that there was a sabi, a six-year-old that used to lead his people in salah. He used to lead the, some of the companions in salah where they lived a bit away from Medina or not close to the Prophet sallallahu and that six-year-old would lead the salah. To the extent that those women that were praying behind him, some of the female companions, they said, hide the backside of your imam. Because he was obviously a young person, he didn't have a lot of clothing. So that hadith, the scholars take from it, although they dispute the authenticity of it, like in those that say it is authentic, one of the things that is derived from it is that a six-year-old or seven-year-old, after Tamiz, they can lead the salah. Right. That sort of act, let's say if the hadith is authentic, as is according to a lot of scholars, that sort of action, is it possible that it was hidden from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew, in most cases, who used to lead the Salah. So for that case, then it shows that it is Sunnah Taqiriyah. It is permissible for a young person to lead the Salah. Another example is Mu'ad radiallahu anhu. Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, when he would pray with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would go back to his people and lead them in Salat al-Isha. Also that act, is it possible that, obviously it was done during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is it possible that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not have known about it? Hmm? Is it possible? Huh? 
more of a possibility than the first one. Ahsant, that's what I was looking for. This category wouldn't even come under this specific section. Although some of the Mashaykh uh, mention it under this category. Lakin, in that istidlal, there's a bit of a ashkal because the Prophet ﷺ was informed about this. Did he not وسلم, say that? Which means that the Prophet knew about it. وسلم. So this would actually come under which category? The free, previous category being that which he knew about. طيب. The second category for this, or the second subcategory is that it is something that was done during the time of the Prophet وسلم, like it is possible that it was hidden from the Prophet it is possible that it was hidden from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And for this, the scholars use the evidence of the hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu, in which he said, كَانُوا يَسْتَدِلُ بِغَالِ شَيْءُ جَوَازِ بَعْسْتِلَّانِهِمْ عَزْلَعَمْ كُنَّا نَعْزِلُ وَالْقُرْآنُ يَنْزِلُ كُنَّا نَعْزِلُ وَالْقُرْآنُ يَنْزِلُ we used to do azl whilst the Qur'an was coming down. Azl is when a man ejaculates outside of the private parts of his wife. When a man ejaculates outside of the private parts of his wife. That is called al-azl. طيب. Now that was done during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu As the companions are saying, radiallahu anhum, kunna na'zilu wal Qur'an yanzil. We used to do that and the Qur'an would be revealed. طيب. Now that is something that can be hidden. Sah? Obviously that's something that takes place in a man's home. That is something that can be hidden. Therefore, for that category, we can't say it is sunnah taqayyiriyah. Something that can be hidden from the Prophet. Something that was done during his time, like it is possible that the Prophet did not know of sallallahu alayhi wasallam. For that case, we can't use that as sunnah taqayyiriyah. We can't acknowledge that as part of the sunnah taqayyiriyah. Is that understood? طيب. So that hadith is used as evidence. The hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu is used as evidence. Lakin, the mahal shahid that we, or the point of this mas'ala is wal Qur'anu yanzil, the Qur'an was revealed. So the scholars, whilst the Qur'an was being revealed, so the scholars say that it is permissible. Al-Azl in general is permissible. طيب. Although it is disliked. Lakin it is permissible. Like in the companion said, what well, Quran yanzil. They didn't use the Sunnah Taqiriya. What did they use as evidence? They said the Quran was being revealed. Why? Mahalu Shahid is where? If the, uh? Mm. Mm. Nah. So they're saying, well, Quran yanzil and the Quran was being revealed because. If it was haram, yes, the Prophet ﷺ did not know about it. However, Allah ﷻ knew about it. Therefore, they're saying the Qur'an was being revealed and Allah allowed us to do it. It was permissible to do. Right. Is that understood? Lakin, for that istidlal, there's a bit of ishkal as well. And the reason is because there's other narrations in this hadith where it clearly states that this reached the Prophet ﷺ. فَلَمْ يَنْهَا عَنْهَا فَلَمْ يَنْهَنَ عَنْهَا He did not prohibit us from it. So that would actually take it from this category to where? The first category which was something that was done in his presence or in his time and he knew about it. Why? Because the, some of the narrations mention that the Prophet heard about it and he did not prohibit them from, from doing so. طيب. So على أي حال that is Sunnah uh, taqayyiriyah It's something that was done in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Or during his time And he had knowledge of it And he did not rebuke it And he did not condemn it And he did not command them to stay away from it and That shows that it is permissible And in most cases This category of sunnah Points towards al-jawaz Permissibility Permissibility So for example now The hadith of Um, 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 um Zarah The hadith of the 11 women where they came to Aisha radiallahu anha's home and each and every single one of them informed the others about their husband. 
about their husbands. So one would say he's this, the other would say that, and so on and so forth. The hadith of Umm Zaga, I believe it was. Type. The fact that women can do that at times, do we say it is a sunnah for them to do so? La. You say it is what? Permissible. The lowest level of legislation is permissibility. If it's not legislated in terms of wajib or sunnah, then the lowest level is what? Permissibility. Type. Then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, at the end of the of that mabhath of that section he says ومثال ما اضيف الى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من مصر وصف في خلق كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من اجود الناس واشجعهم طيب ومثال ما اضيف الى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من مصر في خلقته كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ربعه من الرجال ليس بطويل ولا بالقصير طيب this last part of the uh, تعريف obviously it doesn't concern the usuliyun it concerns the muhaddithun because it is talking about the description of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم it talks about the description Like in the Sheikh says Rahimahullah For example From the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam In his character Is that he was the Bravest of the people And the most generous of the people And From the traits of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Physically Is that he was He was not short But he was not very tall As well He wasn't tall Like he was Of medium height Closer to To being taller Aqsamul khabar bi'atibari ma yudafu ilayhi Now we're going into Obviously we're in sunnah These mabahis that are left these mabahis that are left in Qismu Sunnah They're related more to Ilm al-Hadith, Ilm al-Stalah Hadith Than to Usul al-Fiqh There are only a few parts that Concern the Usuli in general That concern the Usuli in general So this taqseem Or the Sheikh is going to mention different taqseems Different angles in which he's going to look at The Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So he says Aqsamu al-Khabar Khabar The Sunnah when you're looking at who it has been attributed to, it has different categories. And it is of three categories. طيب. And this categorization is nothing to do with authenticity or weakness. That is yet to come. So now we're going to be talking about maqtu' maqfu' and so on. Like it has not, it's not connected to whether a hadith is authentic or not. It merely relates to who the statement has been attributed to. It relates to what? Who said the statement? Not whether it is authentic or not. So the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, the first is Ma'udifa. So he says it is Ma'fu' Ma'quf and Maqtu'. Write it separately, separately. Ma'fu' Ma'quf and Maqtu'. The Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, Fal Ma'fu' Ma'udifa ila Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam haqiqatan aw hukman. فَالْمَغْفُوعُ مَغْفُوعُ is that which has been attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that which has been attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meaning قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى وَسَلَمْ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى وَسَلَمْ سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى وَسَلَمْ the Prophet said I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said for, narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meaning it has been attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and there's two words here that are quite important that you need to underline حَقِيقَةً أو حُكْمًا حَقِيقَةً أَوْ حُكْمًا And he's going to elaborate on both. He's going to elaborate on both. So he says, فَالْمَغْفُوعُ حَقِيقَةً So مَغْفُوعُ is of two types. First and foremost, what is مَغْفُوعُ? مَأُدِيفَ لِلنَّبِي That which has been attributed to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And it is of how many types? Two. حَقِيقَةً أَوْ حُكْمًا طيب. Now he's going to explain this. He's going to explain what it means. طيب. The first is حَقِيقَةً that which has been attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu in reality Meaning the Prophet literally said or did or acknowledged it Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Said it or acknowledged it Or did it And that is everything that has preceded Qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam All of the ahadith that, has been, that we've talked about in the first part of the class That is an evidence of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Haqiqatan like, the second part is مغفوعاً or مغفوعاً حكماً And this is p- quite important, pay attention It is ما أضيف إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مما لا يدل على مباشرته إياه It is that which has been narrated It has That which has been narrated to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم لكن it doesn't say whether he said it clearly or did it or Condemned it or condoned it Condoned it It doesn't specifically say that Lakin there are certain words That point towards it 
that point towards it. So for example, if a companion says, مِنَ السُنَّةِ كَذَا If a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu says, مِنَ السُنَّةِ كَذَا From the Sunnah is this. From the Sunnah is this. Or, كُنَّا نُؤْمَرْ We were commanded with this. We were commanded with this. So for example, you can say, مَا أُضِيفَ إِلَى سُنَّتِهِ The first and foremost is that which has been attributed to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Pay attention here. Marfu' is of how many types? Two. What? Haqiqatan, meaning the Prophet said it, or did it, or agreed with it. Second is what? Hukman. Meaning it is not specifically from the wording of the Prophet, or the actions of the Prophet, or the acknowledgement of the Prophet. However, there are supporting evidences attributing it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the first is, if a companion says ma udhif ila sunnati if a companion says min sunnati kada from the sunnah is that so for example anas radiyallahu anhu he says min sunnati ila tazawwaja al bikra ala al thayyib aqama indaha sab'an thumma ghassam wa ida tazawwaja al thayyib aqama indaha thalathan thumma ghassam tayyib min sunnati ila tazawwaja al bikra ala al thayyib ila tazawwaja al bikra ala al thayyib na'am so Anas says, Allah, and from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that if a man, a thayyib, if a, ma- if a bikr uh, marries a thayyib, if a man marries a woman who, is, who has previously been married, then he stays with her. La, aks, if a man marries a woman that is a virgin, then he stays with her seven nights and he's got other wives. Tabha. He stays with her seven nights, seven days, and then... He carries on splitting the days between her and the other wives. However, if she is married, if she has been married before, obviously she's no longer married, she has been married before, then he stays with her three days. So Anna says what? Mina Sunnati. So if a companion says Mina Sunnati kada, more often than not what? It points towards the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the companions of the Prophet, they knew what the Lalatul al Fad mean. They were Aqhah, they were Arab. They were from the Arab. Arabs. Therefore, they know what it means when they're saying that this is from the Sunnah. So it means that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded this. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded this. Or if a companion says min sunnah tayyib, the second category for that is ma udifa ila ahdihi. That which is attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's time. So, for example, they say. مثلاً, are we allowed to eat cow- horses, for example? And they say that نحرنا على عهد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فرساً فأكلنا. During the, the, for example, this مسألة comes up, and then one of them said, رضي الله عنه بليب أسمى بليب it was, she said that during the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم we slaughtered an, a, a horse and we ate it. So what has she used? The fact that that was done during the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. That kind of has a link with Sunnah. That which was done in his time. Like in he did not, let's say he did not know of it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like in the companions are saying that it was done during his time. Also, another sign is if a companion says, kunna nu'maru, we were commanded with, or a companion says, nuhina an kada, we were prohibited from this. Now when a companion says that, it means who is the one that is prohibiting them? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Who is the one that is commanding them? The Prophet sallallahu Alayhi wasallam. So that is the meaning of that which is being attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam hukman. And you will often find that if a companion, they say, if a companion says something that cannot be said out of ijtihad. So if a companion informs us of something to do with ilm al ghaib and it is not something that a person can come up with out of ijtihad, then the scholars say that lahu hukmu raf'i. It takes the hukum of a raf'i, meaning we lift it up up a little bit more from the companion to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the Sheikh says, rahimahullah, naam, naam, also he mentions the qawl of Atiyah radiyallahu, um Atiyah radiyallahu anhu, she, he says, that she said radiyallahu, nuhina an ittiba' al-janaizi, wa lam ya'zim alayna. We were prohibited from following the janaiz. Taban, who prohibited them? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So all of that which has proceeded takes the hukum of a rafa Then the shaykh says, rahimahullah, wal mawquf. He mentions al mawquf 
And al-mawquf is that which has been ma'udhif ila al-sahabi radiyallahu anhu wa lam yathbut lahu hukmu ghaf. That statement which has been attributed to a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa lam yathbut lahu hukmu ghaf. And it doesn't take the hukum of raf'i, of meaning it being attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So for example, a companion doesn't say qala rasulullah. Is that mawquf? No. Mawquf is that which the companion says. And he does not say that the Prophet said it, or did it, or agreed with it, or commanded them with, or prohibited them from. Meaning it is a statement from him. Right. So who is the companion? The companion, the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, at the end, he gives the ta'rif at the end. He says, or the definition of a tabi'i is, man ijtama'a bin Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mu'minan bihi, wa mat ala dalik. So the scholars say that the sahabi or a sahabi is the one that met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or was gathered with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So sometimes you will find them saying in the books of hadith, man laqiyya. Laqiyya is correct as well, lakin man ijtama'a is a bit better because during the Hajj, for example, Hajjatul Wada, there were many companions, and many of them didn't meet the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like in Manijtama'a, whoever was gathered with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, mu'min and bihi once believing in him, wa mat ala dalik, and he died upon that. So, how many quyud are there? You know what quyud are, right? Restrictions. How many quyud are there for a companion, for a person to be a companion? Three. First, ijtima' bin Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They have to gather with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Secondly. Iman, they have to believe in the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Obviously Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, these people would not be Mu'minun, although they met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the third is al maut ala dalika. This disqualifies those who uh, apostated after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is who a companion is. Like, pay attention for a second here. According to the ulama of hadith, and according to ulama of sharia, in general, that is the definition of a companion. However, now we're going into a mas'ala called Madhabu Sahabi or Qawlu Sahabi. The statement of a companion is a hujja or not? And they call it Madhabu Sahabi or Qawlu Sahabi. However, when the Usuliyun are talking about a companion, they're not talking about anyone who just met the Prophet وسلم, or just happen to be in the same gathering as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then dispersed. When the companions are talking, when the Suliyun are talking about a companion, they are referring to a person who stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for a long period of time. Pay, yani write that down, it's very important because the companion, according to the Suliyun, when they're talking about the Qawl al-Sahabi, هل هو حجة أم لا? Is it a حجة or not? They're referring to a person who meets all of these quyud that we've just studied, these three quyud. However, they add, it has to be a person who stayed with the Prophet ﷺ for a long period of time. Because that is, number one, the reality of suhba, friendship. Because a sahib is that person which is with you all the time. So they say the reality of the suhba for it to be established, hatta tatahakkaq, for it to be established, it has to be a person who st- spent a lot of time with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And why do they do that? Because when we're talking about the qawl al-sahabi, we want to derive legislative rulings from his actions, from his statements, right? So we need to be able to understand We need to be sure That this person is a faqih He's a person that spent time with the Prophet ﷺ. He witnessed the revelation coming down upon the Prophet ﷺ, And he knew the reason why many of the revelations were revealed Many of the verses of the Quran And many of the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, He knows the circumstances and the scenario That was surrounding it for the Prophet to say this Or for this verse to be revealed and that in return gives them a malaka, ilmiya. It gives them an attribute of knowledge whereby they can derive rulings just by it being given to them. So you give them a nazila. And did that not happen with the statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu when they told him about a woman 
who wasn't prescribed with a mahar, she got married, she wasn't given a mahar, and her husband died. So they said, first of all, what, in, what inheritance does she get? Or does she even get inheritance? They said, what about the mahar? Does she get mahar? Because the husband that died, the radiallahu anhu, did not what? G- give her a specific amount. He did not say, I'm going to give you X amount of money. So they said, what do we do about the inheritance? Does she inherit or not? Because obviously he hasn't entered into her at home. The marriage hasn't been consummated. Type. Secondly, what should we do about the mihr? We don't know of an amount. Sec- thirdly, what about the idda? Mahalu shahid, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he anhu gave a hukum. He says she takes, she gets inheritance. With the mahr, she gets mahr mithl. And for the divorce, she gets what? She has to wait four days and ten de- four months and ten days. When he said that, shortly after, or in the same majlis, a companion said, "Very." I heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam give that exact same ruling. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was extremely happy. Why? Because his ijtihad was in accordance with the ijtihad of who? The Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he was happy regarding that. So the companion that these the usulun are referring to is someone who we know witnessed the revelation and has a malaka ilmiya fiqhiyya that we can derive rulings from. Is that understood? Just like when we're talking about sunnah, the muhaddithun they've got a way of looking at the sunnah, right? And the usulun they've got a way of looking at the sunnah. The same goes for the companion of the Prophet sallallahu companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the qawl al-sahabi or أو أو مذهب الصحابي. So where the Sheikh says ما أضيف إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. طيب. So where you say والموقوف ما أضيف إلى صحابي ولم يثبت له حكم رف وهو حجة على قول راجح على القول الراجح. Next to that right حكم قول الصحابي حكم قول الصحابي أو حجية مذهب الصحابي حجية مذهب الصحابي so have that as a as a side title uh, as a subtitle on the side so now that you've understood who is meant by a companion the next مسألة we need to know is is the statement of the companion a حجة a proof or not but before that, what is the statement that is attributed to the prophet, to the companion called Al Mawquf? Waqaf ala Umar, Waqaf ala Abi Bakr, Waqaf ala Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum ajma'in. The Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, in explaining this, he says, Wahuwa hujjatun ala al qawli rajih. So the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, that it is a qawl, the, the stronger opinion is that it is hujjah, and that is madhab of the Hanabila, according to an opinion, uh, one of the riwayat that they have, and also some of the Shafi'iyah. Lakin he says, Illa an yukhalif al So he says, the statement of the companion is a hujjah. Unless, of course, yukhalif al Unless it contradicts or it opposes a nas. What is meant by nas here? Quran and Sunnah. Naam. Quran and Sunnah. If it contradicts the Quran and the Sunnah, then we act upon the what? The Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah. Or إلا أن يخالف قول الصحابي الآخر. Or it opposes the statement of another companion. It goes against or it contradicts the statement of another companion. طيب. Soon in a minute we're going to do تحريم حال النزاع. If a companion says something and another companion says something else which contradicts it, none of them can be proof upon each other. That's number one. Number two, none of the statements can be a proof within, it, within itself. Lakin, what do we do in this case? We look at which one is closer to the Sunnah and the Quran and the Sunnah. Which statement has more supporting evidence? فَإِنْ خَالَفَ نَصًا أُخِذَ بالنص. If he opposes a statement, the companion radiallahu anhu, obviously never intentionally. Like should the companion oppose a hadith, for example, that he did not hear of, then ukhid bin nas, we take the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu or the ayah. Wa in khalafa qawla sahabiyin akhag, and if he opposes a statement of another companion, what is the result? What do we do? Ukhid bi rajih minhuma, we take the one that is what? Stronger. The one that is stronger. So with regards to the qawla sahabi, is it a hujjah or not? 
I want you to do Tahrir Mahal Nizah. Write down Tahrir Mahal Nizah. Tahrir Mahal Nizah means that you mention the points of ittifaq, the points of consensus that they agree upon, so that you can highlight the point of evidence. That is the meaning of Mahal, Tahrir Mahal Nizah. And the Sheikh mentioned some of this. So the first mas'ala is اتفق الأصوليون على أنه إن خالف النص لا يحتج به If the first mas'ala is there's a consensus among the scholars among the usuliyun that if a companion opposes obviously unintentionally opposes a text from the Quran or the Sunnah لا يحتج به it is not taken as evidence. It is not taken as evidence. Secondly, there's a consensus among the Usuliyun that if a companion opposes another companion, None can be used as a proof against the other. None can be used, meaning none of the statements can be used as proof against the other. Rather, we look at which statement or which madhab is closer to the sun to the Sharia. Also, there's a consensus among the scholars that if the companions differ on a certain mas'ala, also there's a consensus among the, compa- among the scholars that if the, scholar, if the companions differ into two opinions or a certain number of opinions, we cannot introduce a third statement or a third opinion. So let's say the companions have difference of opinion on two, into two statements. One says this and one says that. We as the latter part of this ummah can only go with one of those. The one that is closer to the sunnah. Like if we can't say we're going to get another third opinion and we're going to totally disregard the two opinions of the companions. Why? Because this necessitates that there was a time when they weren't upon the haq And I as the third person, third party came with the haq So that is also incorrect And the fourth point is they differ over The statement of the companion The word or the thing that the companion says The statement the companion says in which there's no possibility where they said it from their own logic. For example, if it's from the ilm al-ghayb, it is not something that they can come up with themselves. Or, now it is not something, or it is something that they can come up with themselves. Afwan. They... They, uh, they differ over if a statement says, if a companion says something that they can make up on their own, meaning it is not something that is connected to the ilm al-ghayb. They say a general statement. وَلَمْ يَشْتَهِكْ بَيْنَ sahaba, And it was not something that was known among the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, the first, he says it out of ijtihad He says it out of ijtihad himself Secondly, it wasn't something that was commonly known among the companions Meaning his statement did not reach all of the companions And there was no other companion that opposed him So this is the Mahal shahid It is something that they said out of ijtihad and it wasn't something that was well known among the companions Because if it was well known It goes to something called Ijma' Sukuti And we're going to see that soon inshallah So number one It was something out of Ijtihad 
Ijtihad, you know, obviously his own reasoning and the knowledge that he had. Secondly, it was something that wasn't, it wasn't common or widespread among the companions. Thirdly, there was no other companion that opposed him in it. With these three quyud, there's khilaf over whether it is a hujjah or not. Have you understood where the masala is? If a companion says something out of ijtihad, and it wasn't common among the companions, meaning to the extent that they all knew of it and they agreed with it. Because if they did, it would be ijma'ah, it would be consensus. And thirdly, there was no other companion that opposed him in it. If these three things are met in the companion's statement, then some of the scholars say it is a hujjah. And that is what Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, he says. Why is that? They say first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُمْ Allah Jalla wa Ala praised those people who follow the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the way that you can fully follow them is that you take their statements. That's one. Also, they say that the Sahaba رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ They witnessed the revelation coming down upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, they have more knowledge of the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than anyone else. And they have knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah as a whole. They have a complete understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So any rule, and they know the objectives of the Maqasid al-Shari'ah, the objectives of the Sharia. Therefore, the ruling that they give, the ijtihad that they give, is obviously based on the Qur'an and, and the Sunnah. So that is one opinion. Another opinion is that it is not a hujjah. Why? Simply because they're not ma'sumin. Simply because they're not ma'sumin. Simply because they are not ma'sumin. And we're going to leave that there. Lacking. Remember when we said, or when I said earlier on, that evidences are of two. Those which there's consensus over. Quran, Sunnah, Ijma' and Qiyas. Remember? And then there are evidences that they differ over. This is one of those diff- evidences that they differ over. This is one of those evidences that they differ over. Yes, based on if they say it is not a hujjah, naam. If they say it is not a hujjah, then they can go against it. Not because it's a companion statement, but because it is not evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. It is not hujjah shari'ah, they're saying. Right. And there's obviously khilaf, there's thamaratul khilaf, there's a benefit of the khilaf. Because if we say we're taking the madhab of the companions, if we find the general statement, we're going to do it, make it khas with the statement of the companion. If there's a mutlaq statement, then we're going to say muqayyad with the statement of the companion. So there's thamaratul khilaf, it is not just the khilaf just for the sake of it. Lakin it has repercussions as they say for accepting or rejecting that khilaf. Lakin we're going to see that in other books that we study in Surah Al-Fiqh insha'Allah. Tayyip. So that is with regards to Qawl al-Sahabi. Then the Sheikh says, Rahimahullah, wal maqtu' And maqtu' is wa ma'udifa ila atabi'i fa man ba'dahu. Maqtu' is that which has been attributed to a tabi'i or anyone that came after the tabi'in. Atba'u tabi'in and so on. So that is the meaning of maqtu' And a tabi'i is man ijtama' bi sahabi mu'minan bihi mu'minan bi rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ma ta'ala dhalik. So a tabi'i is the one that met any of the companions, believed in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and died whilst believing in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Taib. Aqsamu al-khabak bi'atibari turqihi. I think we should play maghrib and then come back for this section inshaAllah. And then we're going to, once we finish this, we're going to start on al-ijma' bi'idnillahi ta'ala. Allah ta'ala a'lam wa ahkamu billahi tawfiq. وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا